Previously on Dragon Ball Z. Nematodes, vinegar eels, detritus worms, flatworm, planaria, anchor worms, annelids, leeches, ostracods, copepods, daphnia, amphipods, scud, isopods, hydra, bug larvae, mosquito, dragonfly, and damselfly, rotifers, phytoplankton, pest types of snails. Keep your shrimp pan strong. Welcome back to Bob Moss Nano Tanks. This is part two of my aquarium microfauna video series. I wasn't really planning on making it a series. I made the first one about a year ago. You guys really seem to like that. It's one of my most, actually it's the most popular video on the channel. So thank you all for that. Clearly you guys like little bugs and shit. So I'm gonna try and cover the ones that I missed in the first one. In this one, you know, I'm only human. Sometimes we miss things so I can milk it for more views. Bruh. So in the first video, I already covered the most basic types of aquarium microfauna you're gonna see. These ones are a little bit more obscure. But let's just jump right into the new list. Let's give the people what they want and start sciencing it up and yeah, let's go! First thing I wanted to clear up in my previous video, I misspoke about Hydra. I have since made a video clearing this up, but I thought I would reiterate here, Hydra is not a plant, it is a polyp. These are basically just very small animals with a sac-like body and a mouth encircled by stinging tentacles. Other polyps include jellyfish and corals. Anyway, this is gonna be a long one, so buckle up, buckaroos. Water mites. Scientific name Hydrocnidia. Young mites are considered parasitic. They don't usually cause the death of their host, but they can damage its health if the population gets too high. The larvae are the only water mite life stage to have a parasitic relationship with other organisms. When they find a host, the larvae latch onto them with their little claws and feed on the blood until fully grown or brushed off. As adults, most mites are predatory. However, they generally feed on algae or insect larvae, not fish and shrimps. Some aquatic mites, however, feed on detritus and plants rather than living organisms. When feeding, the mites grab their prey and use their little piercing mouth parts to puncture the food and suck all the juices out. Mm. Both the adult and young stages of the aquatic mite live beneath the water surface, so it's best to remove larvae if you see them before they can reproduce into larger numbers. Water mites are found in a wide range of freshwater environments, but they prefer to live in still waters such as ponds, slow-moving rivers, and streams. They are much less common in fast-moving waters, so having some good flow in your tank can prevent them from appearing in the first place. Wow. They can usually be found among aquatic plants, feeding on the algae and plant life. Water mites can be seen easiest on the vegetation in shallow regions of ponds and lakes, so they don't like deep or fast-moving water. They are probably not harmful to your fish and shrimp, but you don't want the populations getting too high like any of these things. It's just gross. That sounds disgusting. Fish lice. Scientific name Argulus foliaceus. So I kind of covered these in the last video. They are a type of isopod. However, they are fully aquatic compared to many of the more common types of isopods you see as they are known as pill bugs. These guys are flat with an oval or rounded body, two compound eyes, sucking mouth parts, and two suction cups it uses to attach to the host. Its arms and legs have hooks and spines and they're used for swimming. Fish lice are up to seven millimeters long by five millimeters wide but in large numbers, you'll see them much smaller. They won't have enough room to get big. The female is larger than the male, like most aquatic species. They are able to live in marine, brackish, and freshwater environments. All life stages of both sexes are parasitic. Oh, no. It attaches to its host, usually a fish, via its suction cups, pierces the skin with its sharp mouth, and feeds on the blood. It may also live in the gills, a heavy infestation causes inflammation of the skin upon hemorrhaging wounds, increased production of mucus, loss of scales, and corrosion of the fins. The wounds are often infected with bacteria and fungi, which further degrade the skin layers. The fish can become anemic. During feeding, the louse also injects these digestive enzymes into the flesh. Infested fish may exhibit loss of appetite and slowed growth and behavioral signs such as erratic swimming and rubbing up against the aquarium walls. The damage and infection can cause stress and eventually mortality. Once the population becomes established, the only way to fully remove them is through chemicals. You can lower the population through manual removal like nets and water changes. However, nuking the tank with something like, it's called Dimlin, is 
is recommended to remove them completely. Please use proper dosage for this stuff. I don't want you killing your fish. I'm not giving you the dosage. I'm just telling you what I found about this. Okay, next point. Rabdacola. Scientific name Rabdacola. These are a type of flatworm commonly mistaken for planaria. They are completely harmless to your shrimp and fish, and most fish will actually eat them as a secondary food source. They feed on algae and biofilm that grows naturally in your tank's ecosystem. They are in the same family as nematodes, but they are non-parasitic. If they bother you, changing your feeding schedule of the tank can help limit reproduction. They just, they feed on the excess food, right? So if you just limit your feedings, you'll limit their population similar to seed shrimp. Nailed Spot it. treatment with H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, can also kill them. But honestly, I don't worry about these at all. And they're generally a sign of good microbiology, similar to seed shrimps as I mentioned. Uh, just enjoy the good signs, I guess. Enjoy it. Water beetle. Not exactly, but scientific name, something like Dittisid. A water beetle is a generalized name for any beetle that is adapted to living in water at any point in its life cycle. Most water beetles can only live in fresh water, but there are a few marine species. Water beetles can be herbivores, predators, or scavengers. The herbivorous beetles eat only aquatic vegetation, such as algae or leaves. They might also suck juices out of the stem of a plant nearby. The scavenger beetles will feed on decomposing organic material that has deposited. The scavenged material can come from vegetation, poo-poo, feces, you know, or other small organisms that have died, like they'll eat your dead shrimp, dead fish, but they won't kill the live ones. And then you have things like the great diving beetle, which is a predator, and this feeds on things like worms, tadpoles, and even small fish. Remember that beetles may eat things that you would prefer to keep alive, such as your fish. So if you see them, manual removal upon sight is the best practice. Tight-fitting lids can prevent them in the first place. Diving beetles may attack fish or other insects, even if they are larger, and eat them. Diving beetles also have a defense mechanism. They secrete a toxic substance that can make vertebrates such as fish sick if both are kept in a shared environment so if you see them in the tank get them out of there asap some examples of water beetles are the giant water bug this will kill fish the great diving beetle this will also kill fish the water scavenger beetles this will eat your shrimp and snails but not your fish uh these things are nasty and uh, dear god i don't want to look at them anymore okay next next kill me kill me bryozoa scientific name ectoprocta Bryozoans are filter-feeding invertebrates that are found in both freshwater and marine environments, where they are often easy to miss because of their small size and cryptic lifestyle. They encrust themselves in seashells, rocks, and plants. They are less than one millimeter in diameter, and in almost all species, the individuals live together as a colony that encrusts these surfaces. They grow branching structures, or in freshwater species, they can form a gelatinous blob. They have a body with a U-shaped gut opening up the mouth and the butt. I'm a rapper, don't even know it. What, what, what? They feed with their weird mouth thingy. Their tentacles are covered in tiny hairs that all move together. And the beating of these hairs creates a current of the water, which drives food, mainly algae, towards their little mouth thinger. They do not have a respiratory or a blood system because their small size allows a diffusion of gases and nutrients through their surface area. Like... What is that? Like single cell organisms and stuff, like bacteria. It's kind of cool. They do have a simple nervous system, however, and muscles, which together can make them kind of shrink to avoid predators when something comes nearby. If you notice these in your tank, you can try removing them manually, possibly treating the decor they are in with like bleach or peroxide. You know, you got to take it out to treat it with, with bleach. Yeah. Uh, or a surefire method is UV sterilization, although that one's a little bit, little bit pricier. I don't think they're harmful. They're just annoying. You know, it's, re it's really up to you, whatever you want to do. You can create any world that you want. Springtails. Scientific name Kalimbala. These are very small, ancient, six-legged animals that live in and around soil, as well as up trees, on ponds, and basically anywhere else you can think of. They are tiny, jumpy bugs that you will see on top of your water. They may have a brown, black, or off-white appearance, depending on the lights around your tank. If you have stagnant water in the aquarium that evaporates constantly, making its surroundings humid and moist, that's what attracts these springtails. 
since they cannot survive without moisture. The springtails feed on mold and algae that is around the tank, and having those two in your aquarium is enough for them to survive and propagate. You can get rid of springtails in your aquarium by doing like 20% water changes every so often and slowly reducing their numbers because you know they live on the, the surface. You can also introduce algae eating fish and keep the lights off at night to manage the algae that springtails feed on. Trim your plants, scrape off any mold and build up in and around the aquarium and stop overfeeding the fish since the springtails can also eat decaying food. Use something like an air conditioner or dehumidifier to reduce humidity since high humidity levels will attract these bugs. Did I speak right there? However, springtails are not dangerous or poisonous to fish and it's okay if your fish swim up to eat them. However, a little caveat, if your fish eat springtails on the surface that have eaten too much mold from a dirty aquarium, they may die after some time depending on the amount consumed. So, um, be careful. It's better to be hurt by someone you know accidentally than by a stranger on purpose. Livonica. Scientific name Livonica Radmanii. This is a specific type of isopod that can be considered a real aquarium vampire. These small crustaceans are parasitic to fish. Most often you will see them stuck near the gills or in their mouth attached to the tongues. They are mainly introduced to your aquariums through wild caught fish. Uh, individuals can be removed manually with tweezers. If there are many and the damage to the fish is bad, use special medications. Uh, you can apparently use potassium permanganate, but this is dangerous so don't tell anyone when you heard it from me, uh, look up everything. A small error with the concentration of this will give you big problems, especially in sensitive fish. Fortunately, the Livonica does not usually breed in aquariums since it has to pass through the larval stage before adulthood, and at that time, it should be eaten by your other fish. Fish fight back. Throat punch, absorb the blow. Slime mold. Scientific name Physrum. This is a name given to several kinds of unrelated eukaryotic organisms that can live as single cells, but can also clump together to form multicellular structures. Slime molds used to be classified as a fungus, but they are no longer considered part of that group. These are uncommon in aquariums, although small colonies could go unnoticed. They feed on decaying matter, so they are a sign of a bigger problem if you do see them. They're not likely to threaten your fish directly, but if you can see slime molds or tufts of fungi, there's something in the tank decaying that they're digesting. In this process, you know, they're producing waste products like everything else that the filter has to deal with, raising nitrate levels higher than normal. A deep substrate can be very good at accumulating debris that the slime mold could be feeding on if not properly vacuumed. It's also very easy to overstock a small aquarium or overfeed the tank, and the detritus will provide food for the slime mold. The most common time people deal with slime molds in an aquarium is after adding fresh wood as decoration, as opposed to like cure driftwood. Organic material in the wood provides food for the slime molds. These tend to go away over time though. Overall, not something to freak out about, but it's also, you know, not, not very pretty. We all see nature through different eyes. Ranatra. Scientific name Ranatra. These are known as water scorpions or water stick insects. Once again, very uncommon, mainly found in stagnant or slow moving water. So decent flow and lids will prevent them in the first place. They do eat small fish. So if you notice them, you need to get rid of them before they take out your nano fish colony. If you have like, you know, Oscars, this will just be lunch for them. They are considered a sit and wait predator that stays among the plants and positions themselves head down with their legs extended out to surprise passing prey. They should be easy to spot if you do ever encounter them. They have a long tail like siphon or breathing tube on the rear end of their body. The adults are generally like two to six centimeters, which is like an inch to two and a half inches, depending on the exact species. The females are a little larger than males. The siphon is typically almost the same size, but that varies from less than half the body length to somewhat longer, depending on the species again. They may reproduce if you don't notice them. Their eggs are laid on plants just below the water surface and typically take two to four weeks to hatch, and then the young take about two months to mature. So you do have some time to react there, but kind of gross. I could, ew. That's nasty. Yuck. Yuck, yuck. Larva, alderfly, caddisfly, stonefly, mayfly, water boatman, rat tail, maggots, black soldier fly, whirling beetle, 
Cre Creon Midai, whatever that one is. Bruh. So these are a bunch of the bug larvae I missed in the first one. I could go over each one and explain the details of them, but it's much easier to just flash some pictures with the text of each type and let you figure it you out. Suck. So comment below if you're having trouble. I can try to help you out. Uh, flashing before your eyes has been the larva of the alder flies, the caddis flies, the stone flies, may flies, water boatmen, rat tail maggots, wait, what, ew, uh, black soldier flies, the whirly gig beetle, uh, that's a pretty dumb name, look, look at my whirly gig, loser, and uh, we'll finish it off with something I cannot pronounce, god give me strength, the chironomidae ch larva. Hopefully this is enough time to roll all the pictures. Remove these manually before they kill all your stuff. Some of these larvae are more passive, but the bugs will have lunch. Uh, some of them are just an annoyance. Most of these are pretty gross and unsightly. Depending on your fish, they may just eat them for dinner. You know, Renatra was lunch, so this is dinner. But smaller nano fish and our cute shrimps could be in danger. Uh, is that good? At editing Bob, is this enough? Is this enough foot? Is this enough time? I'm sorry, I get crazy. Malaysian trumpet snails. Scientific name Melanoids tuberculata. So I covered everything I thought that was, was a pest snail, but someone wanted me to add Malaysian trumpet snail to the list. So I guess these can be considered a pest snail because they reproduce asexually, meaning one will turn into many. And then if there's not enough food to support the billions of babies produced, they may cause an ammonia spike with the mass die off. So just be aware of that with Malaysian trumpet snails. I have not experienced this myself. I actually love these guys. They live under the substrate and turn the soil. They prevent toxic gas buildups. It's really cool cool, really good stuff. Uh, thanks, snailies. What can I say except you're welcome? And uh, the only thing I don't like about them is they will destroy any soil grading you may have tried in your scape. So just be ready for flatness. <gasps> no, uh, no grading with these guys. The earth is absolutely flat. And that's a wrap. We did it. Hopefully it wasn't too boring for you. If you liked it, make sure to hit that like button. Maybe share it with one of your aquarium friends. If you liked it, they might like it because that, that's how that works, right? If you're new here, make sure to smash that subscribe button. It's free of charge. Patreon shoutouts as always, Leather Turtle, Michael Redman, Brian Dotson. Thank you all so much. And YouTube channel member shoutouts for Tater Salad, Rival, Poseidon's Pets, Robert Redman, Mitch Bob and Jamie Anderson. Mitch Bottoma has a site, shrimpeffects.com. Check that out if you're in Canada. You want some cool shrimp stuff? He's he, he got me the orange shrimp. If you feel like giving me some money, you can get your name shouted out just like those guys. Links are in the description. YouTube channel member shout out, Patreon shout out. There's other perks as well. Also in the description are links for my Discord fan club, my 24 7 shrimp uh, Twitch live stream thing. Check that out. It's good fun. I also have PayPal donation links if you want to help. Uh, help me monetarily without any public recognition you can hit that button you know you can help me buy more tanks for this new rack i have some stuff coming but it kind of it's, it's pricey so thanks again and remember guys until next time keep your shrimp hands strong bye bye now what the fuck did i type here water beetles can be herbivores herb herb Water beetles can be herbivores, predators, or scavengers. The herb, the herb, herbivorous. Fuck me. If you have stagnant water in aquarium, the there's something in the tank decaying, and that the that they're di a, b b b b a deep substrate can be very good at. A, oh, also in the description, links for my Discord for my 24/7.